Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organisers for the invitation. And, um, and thank you for the wonderful music this morning. What a fantastic start to the day. Um, I'm going to talk about um, what, how childhood shape the rest of people's lives. Not all people, and not always in the same way. Um, but how many things can be set down in the early experiences that people have uh, and what can be done about that to prevent those things and then to uh, help those people later on through life and through their adulthood. Uh, it probably is no surprise to people in this room that that happens, that these things change in childhood and they affect the people's lives. Um, but maybe it will be interesting, I hope, to see how much and for how long those impacts last. Um, um, I want to try and make some connections uh, between some of the things people might be more familiar with, perhaps um, problems from drug use in families, with a variety of other things that impact children's lives. Um, because that's the way people experience them, not as individual items, but as multiple pressures on their lives at the same time. Um, and to give the best response, that's how agencies need to work together. And for agencies to work together, they need to understand that the things they're trying to address have shared roots in children's childhood. So very similar experiences are leading to problems for a whole range of agencies, and often those things are being missed. So I'll start that, and through here there'll be a few, a few video clips. They're only a minute long. I apologise everything will be in English, um, uh, uh, and I, I hope you can follow, but please feel free afterwards, or during even, to ask me questions. So I'll start here. This is um, for the first two years of a child's life. Um, their, ba their brain grows from about 25% of the size of the brain at birth uh, to 80% of the adult size within those two years, where billions and billions of connections are laid down. Now, they're not undoable, uh, but the fact that they get those right in the first place makes life an awful lot easier because undoing them afterwards is much more complicated. And during that process, given the right nurturing childhood, children learn empathy, they learn trust, they learn how to communicate and be parts of communities. Um, if they don't, something different happens. Um, this is something most people will be familiar with. Uh, we call it a flight or fright response. So even in a tiny child, but throughout childhood and adulthood, if someone is uh, at rest and something happens, uh, there's, there's a shock then their systems kick in, adrenaline, cortisol kicks off, and they go through a period of excitement, um, of defensiveness, and then they go into a recovery period. Well, I'm going to talk about adverse childhood experiences, and the problem with adverse childhood experiences, if they're persistent, um, is that you don't come down through that recovery phase. Instead, children's bodies set to a higher level of, of alert, and we talk about something called a fixed allostatic load. So if you can imagine any system set to a high state of alert, any system at all, an organization, a building, as well as a person, it wears out more quickly. It's very difficult to keep a body at that level. It's very difficult to keep any system at that level. And I want to show you the consequences of that. So that's a health consequence. But also, there are criminal justice consequences. Um, people who've been exposed to low, high levels of ACEs, I'll talk about what they are in a second, also see neutral faces often as threatening faces um, because that's a life-preserving mechanism for them uh, because they've been under co chronic pressure and it's better to, if you like, lean on the cautious side. And that also means a lot of the time those children in school are anxious, they're disengaged, they're poor learners, they think people are out to get them, they find it difficult to make those sorts of relationships. I'm not going to talk about the, the biology, the biomolecular bits behind it, but I think it's important to know that it's there. So we do know that chronic abuse and neglect leads to visible changes in brain development uh, from Bruce Perry's work and others. Um, we do know that there are now biological markers that are different in people who've experienced chronic stress in childhood. These are a couple of them. One's called C-reactive proteins in the liver, they're very sensible things to have. They help the body repair. Um, the trouble is, in people who are expected to be abused or neglected all the time, those levels go up chronically. And they also lead, as I said, over a long time to increased risks of heart disease and diabetes. 
So the same things that give you immediate, immediate protection long term, if you keep them there, have problems for the body. The same is also true of the immune system. Interleukin-6 is a marker. Um, and again, very sensible if you think you're going to be uh, beaten or something all the time. The problem is if you keep them high all the time, diabetes and cardiovascular disease risks increase. Even at the genetic level, this is something called telomere length, the amount of times a cell can reproduce. It seems that the effect of, of poor quality abusive childhoods has an effect um, on that, reducing the number of times cells uh, can, pass through, uh, can be reproduced. So what are ACEs? Well, these are the ones I'm going to talk about mainly. Sometimes they differ. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, separation of parents. That doesn't necessarily mean the act of separation. It's just that separation is a marker often for something that's happened in the, in the, in the uh, relationship. Emotional neglect and physical neglect. And then in household members, uh, alcohol problems, drug problems, a severe enough problem within the criminal justice system that they're incarcerated, and then people with depression, suicide, or mental health problems in the household as well. All of which create severe and often chronic tensions on children. So this is a study we did with the World Health Organization. Um, it's larger now, but this is across uh, the Baltic states and Eastern Europe. And if you're taking this one, how many people... Um, as children suffered physical abuse? Well, the answer is about one in five children say they were physically abused, or adults say they were physically abused as children. And the levels vary between countries, but what I would point out in all of these is there isn't any country where those levels are at a very low level. The averages across this study, 18% or 18.6, like I said, for physical abuse, um, nearly 7 in 100, or over 7 in 100 people sexually abused as children. Uh, and I'm not going to read all of these out, but if you look down here, um, about 1 in 7 or 1 in 8 people living with people who had an alcohol problem, um, 1 in 20 um, uh, incarcerated, and about 2 to 3% of people living with someone who had some of the more severe drug use in the family, and that's largely we're talking about things like cocaine and heroin use. Um, the problem with studies like this is that people always say, uh, well, of course that doesn't happen in my country. That's because that's the countries you pick to look at. Uh, so these are some other studies we did uh, uh, back in the UK. This is England and Wales. Um, and without forcing the point, you can see that the levels are pretty well the same. Um, and I'll come on later. There is, there's not so much work on ACEs done here. Um, but uh, where there is, I, I would expect, and I'll show you later, that the levels aren't even that dissimilar, but I think we, we don't have big A studies on, on, for instance, Norway. The reality, though, is that a large proportion of children are suffering high levels of stress chronically in their childhood. Uh, Eastern Europe, about 50% of children grow up um, with uh, at least one adverse childhood experience chronically in their childhood. That's half of all children. Um, England and Wales, about the same. And then an important number I want you to, st to focus on for the rest of this is people with four or more ACEs. I'm just going to use that as an example, as a high level of adverse childhood experiences in your childhood. Um, although I, I can say that people with two or three also suffer higher levels of problems. But there, roughly about one in ten children had four or more adverse childhood experience types from that list in their childhood. So now I just want to introduce you um, to um, a, a little lad. Uh, it's only a minute or so, and, and let you watch this. My parents don't understand. All the drinking and fighting means I'm scared. I'd like a cuddle, perhaps a bedtime story. But mostly, I'd like them to stop shouting at me. And sometimes, they hit me. Feeling scared every day and not feeling loved or wanted will change me for the rest of my life. Later, I'll have problems at school, problems with alcohol, and I'll get in trouble with the police. What's happening to me right now means I'm more likely to have serious health problems in middle age and die sooner than I should.
Doctors say my life is full of adverse childhood experiences, or aces. But in my world, this means I see my dad hitting my mum. Dad's got a drinking problem, and mum's always crying, even with the tablets. I am always being shouted at and hit. After the booze and fags, there's not a lot of money for toys or clothes, or even food. I'm getting used to being scared all the time. Now I'm just angry. The doctors say things are changing inside me. My brain isn't learning how to control my feelings properly. My body can't relax like those kids who don't have aces, so my body won't be able to repair itself properly when I get older. Making it more likely I'll get cancer or heart disease as an adult. It hurts when my parents hit me, but the real damage is hidden, and that damage will be with me for life. So, we'll return to that little lad later on. Um, and the first thing I'll say now, because it, it's always a, um, a difficult start, is there are different endings and different opportunities as there are for everybody who experiences that in real life. So ACEs through the life course, adverse experiences, disruption of things like a nervous system, hormonal and immune development, and that can lead to social and emotional problems, um, the adoption of health-harming behaviours, and then things with enormous costs, you could argue even before that, but things like non-communicable disease, disability, low productivity, and in some cases as well, early mortality. Um, you don't have to wait that long to see the problems, of course. And again, that won't be something unfamiliar to people in this room. Somatic complaints are a category of complaints people might be familiar with. Uh, they're things like headaches, digestive problems, skin disorders that kids have. Usually, if you go to see a physician, there isn't really a, a problem, an infection or something like that. And actually, uh, the actual causes are more likely to be stress and emotional factors. Um, so if you look at those through an adverse experience lens, um, this is a study from Wales. Uh, we have others in England. And this is showing you just how much more likely a child with four aces uh, or different ACE numbers is going to be to have those. So if you look at something like headaches, frequent headaches, four, with four or more ACEs, they're three times more likely to report those. They're five times nearly more likely to report general poor health. And they are nearly seven times more likely to report school absenteeism. And that's, in this case, more than 20 days off per year. Um, and school abdomenism is going to be a combination of a whole variety of different things. But you can see that the pressures uh, and the life course for some individuals experiencing is already changing. So we'll just go back now and revisit that lad a little later on after some of these things have happened. I drink and smoke. They say I'm out of control, but I'm not. It's just my way of coping with my aces. I've been in plenty of fights, but what's wrong with that? Kids punches don't hurt half as much as when my dad hits me. I beat up a kid last week at school because he looked at me weird. Who cares? I ended up with more time out of school. Learning's not for me anyway, and the teachers don't care any more than my parents. I don't like the way anyone looks at me except my girl. She's 16 and pregnant, just like my mum was with me. So what we're seeing is the beginning of a cycle, um, and I just want to show you some of those things now in actual numbers. So this is Wales, and again, we have England, and we've got you know, European figures. And in fact, I'll show you sort of a global picture later on, but it's easier for me to use from, some from home. So this is the likelihood of a variety of things happening, depending on whether people had no aces or four aces. And all the figures I'm going to show you are, have already been corrected for whether people grow up in poverty or not. And again, I'll come back to poverty. But this isn't just, isn't just a story about whether people grow up in rich or poor areas. So, they're four times more likely to be a high-risk drinker as adults if they had four aces. Six times more likely to be smokers. Eleven times more likely to be smokers of illegal substances like cannabis. 16 times more likely to be users of crack cocaine or heroin, and 20 times more likely to have been incarcerated in their life, in some point already been locked up in the criminal justice system. So the, the risks, the increase in risks are, I would describe as astronomical, enormous. 
associated with what's happened relatively early on. And of course, some of them are a repeat of what happened to them. So this is a picture, I think, from, uh, I think it's from uh, UNICEF. But it's just showing you a life course of the, person, the, the kid being abused, growing up angry, and then coming back round later on in life to become the parent who dishes out, you know, gives the same sorts of punishments that they receive themselves. In terms of numbers, this is uh, England and Wales, and this is whether people have been involved in violence in the last 12 months. These are just 18 to 29-year-olds. People with no aces, 4% have been involved in, in, in hitting someone, if you like, in the last 12 months. 33% of people with four or more aces. Remember, we're talking about 10% of the whole population. And even up to the age of 49, you can still see those differences are in those populations, even though, of course, the levels of violence have dropped. And on the other side of the equation, being hit, the difference is five up to 37%. And that's not, it's partly because people are more aggressive themselves, so they get into fights, but it's also because people are prepared to put up with situations where they are being hit because that's what they've experienced and that's what they think uh, is something, in some cases, that maybe should be experienced or put up with. So both perpetration and victimisation of violence are part of a cycle uh, that hopefully we can break. Another way of showing this cycle is in teenage pregnancies and, and se sexual behaviour. This is ACE count again. Uh, this is a sample of about 8,000 people, um, I think, for this one. And you can see here, started sex under 8, 16. This is males. I could have shown females. But males, uh, about four times more likely to have started sex under 16. People with four aces, as a result, are 10 times more likely to have got someone pregnant under the age of 18 years. And as a result of that, four times more likely to have had their first child born under the age of 18. But we can look backwards in some of these studies as well. And if we look at these men, they actually were um, four times, uh, five times more likely to have been born to teenage mothers themselves. And again, it's not just one, it's one of multiple markers that show how these issues are passed from one generation to the next. And that's the poor side. But the upside is if you break this intergenerational cycle, then of course you can put families on the right cycle for many years. Um, so we'll return again uh, to this lad now later on in his life. So this is where I've ended up. I've got diabetes and cancer's probably on the way. I know these kill you, but I couldn't do without them. I've never had a proper job and I've spent time inside. I hit my kids. I hit their mum too until she left. So my kids have grown up with aces. And now my daughter had her first kid. She's 16. The course of my life was set in the wrong direction a long time ago. I know where I'm heading and sadly I know where my kids are heading too. So, as we go through the rest of the talk, I'll start slowly to challenge where that person's life's heading and, and show that it can help head in other directions. But first of all, let's just see how often that's the case. This is England. Um, this is the proportion now of things, different problems we see, which we think wouldn't happen, we can calculate wouldn't happen, if we stopped ACEs. If we could stop ACEs, then about a third of all um, uh, early sex, about a third of teenage pregnancy, uh, about one in seven of people are smoking, about one in seven are binge drinking, a third of cannabis and similar use, nearly 60% of heroin and crack cocaine use, if we could stop that, 60%. About half of violence, about half of perpetration, and about one in seven around that of, of things which are related to poor diet. And in fact, the original ACE studies were done on diet and obesity, um, although the link there's not quite as strong as it is with substance use and mental health issues. Mental health is by far the strongest connections. Um, and just to show you this, this is a score called uh, WEMWEB, so it's a, it's a recognised well-being score you may be familiar with. Um, and looking on this, so poor mental well-being, 
people with four ACEs, about 41% of them have poor mental well-being, about 19%, so less than half the number of those with no ACEs. And, and it's quite important to pick apart what's in that score because it can sound like just a number. Um, but I think it, it, it tells you a lot about what people are dealing with. And again, people who will be in the room will be familiar, familiar with it. So this is a whole range of things that people with four ACEs are much more likely to have. But let's, when we're talking to people who have four ACEs, let's focus on a few. They're three times more likely in the last two weeks to have never or rarely felt close to other people. They're four times more likely to have never or rarely been thinking clearly. Quite an important thing if we're trying to change people's behaviour. And they're six times more likely to have never or rarely felt optimistic about the future. And again, when we're trying to change people's behaviour for long-term benefit gains, quite important to understand sometimes, for some people, that state of mind. Um, this isn't my work at all, it's someone else's. It's uh, Mashoud um, from, I think, Norway. And I think, just to show, I, I couldn't find an ACE study, but I think it's just important uh, to, to, to ground this here as well, looking at three things which are effectively ACEs, uh, you know, psychological abuse, substance misuse, distress in childhood, and physical abuse. Um, and people may or may not be familiar with this, but the reports from that particular study was 175% if people had those three things increase in poor mental health, uh, and 89% increase in poor health, and a 42% increase in low mental well-being. So not entirely dissimilar from what I've shown you from other countries, and it would be likely that as more is understood in different countries, it's going to be very similar. So some of the big problems for health, at least, or at least seen that way, non-communicable diseases, cancer, stroke, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, and liver disease. Let's just look later on in a person's life, like that, that, that lad who's now grown up, and just see what that, what's happening. All this is is a line which shows how many people by different ages have developed at least one of those long-term conditions. So... By the age of 59, about 20% of this particular group, and these are people who've got no ACEs, have developed at least one of those long-term life-threatening conditions. This is the same graph for people with four or more ACEs. So by the age of 59, instead of 21% of people having those conditions, it's actually 41%. And another way of looking at that is that people are aging and developing problems about 10 to 15 years faster because of what happened to them as a child than those people who had more safe, secure and nurturing childhoods. And again, these are corrected for deprivation and I will talk about that later. Some conditions are particularly related to it. This is diabetes, similar time by 59, up from 6% up to 25%. And I've shown you earlier on why some of the biomolecular changes, as well as diet, other lifestyle issues, all come together and can affect things like this. It's not cheap for the system as well as for the person. Four times more likely to develop diabetes at any particular stage in life. Three times more likely to develop a respiratory disease if you've got four ACEs compared to none. Three times more likely to develop at any particular stage in life heart disease. And the outcome of that, from other work we and others have published, people with ACEs are three times more likely to have to have attended an accident and emergency or an emergency department in the last 12 months. They're twice as likely to have been frequent attenders at least six or more times to a general practitioner. And they're three times more likely to have had to stay in hospital in the last 12 months at least once. Um, so again... If we don't sort these things out, we pay the costs later on in life quite considerably. This is a global analysis which ourselves and World Health Organization did. Uh, and it, it's just to give you... So this, this now is a whole range of countries. It's every ACE study across the world, across multiple countries. I think 30-odd, maybe more countries we used. And it just shows you the increased risks. So in, physical inactivity and obesity, on average, about 1.2 to 1.4% times higher. Things like physical health, heart disease, cancer, digestive diseases, two or three times higher. Sexual health, um, all the way up to nearly six times higher for having any sexually transmitted infection. Multiple partners around uh, three to four times and teenage pregnancy around the same. And then when we're starting to look at things more related to mental health issues and substance use, the figures get even higher. 
problem drug use, 10 times higher, problem alcohol use, nearly six times higher, any illicit drug use, nearly six times higher. Um, mental health issues, again, three or four times higher. And then, uh, tragically, the things which actually in many ways represent ACEs passing on again, things like violence, eight times higher, higher and the highest of all, suicide attempts, nearly 30 times higher in those who have four or more ACEs compared to none. Um, we're just finishing some work now, um, again, just looking at what the costs of not, not, not dealing with these things are. Um, these are attributable fractions. All, all it means is that the proportion of all smoking, which is down to just having one ACE or more than one ACE, is here. The reason for saying this is I just wanted to show you that actually um, individual conditions by themselves are a smaller part of what's happening to, to the children and the problems than multiple conditions. So the majority of, of the fraction that we see of smoking down to ACEs is from people who suffer more than one type of adversity. The same is true of depression, um, and the same is certainly true of diabetes. And to give you an idea, uh, that 14% of diabetes, if we cut it out globally, uh, would save something like $100 billion in terms of costs for treatment and other issues. So, let's go back to this chap again, but in a slightly different uh, reality. A little help in childhood makes a big difference to where life takes you. When I was a baby, the nurses noticed that my mum wasn't coping and helped her and explained how important my childhood is to the rest of my life. So, with a bit of help, she coped. The police came round after next door complained about the noise from mum and dad fighting. They asked how I was feeling. I told them I was scared all the time. Mum and dad got help. The shouting got better and the hitting stopped. I even got some bedtime stories. I still had problems at school, but the teacher asked me about what was happening at home. I got help controlling my feelings. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough. I'm now married with two children and I've got a job most of the time. I haven't repeated the same problems with my kids. We got help when being a parent got too much. Our children are ace-free, and that means their kids stand a good chance of growing up ace-free as well. Almost half the people in England and Wales experienced one ace as a child, and one in ten of us suffered four or more aces. If we stop aces, millions of children would not become smokers or binge drinkers and levels of violence in adults would be cut in half. Fewer ACEs in childhood also means fewer adults developing diseases like cancer, heart disease and diabetes in middle age. We all need to be ACE aware. Are you? Doctors, police, nurses, teachers, firefighters and most importantly parents. The more you know about ACEs, the more you can help stop children growing up with ACEs in their lives. And for those of you who have already suffered ACEs, the more you know, the more you can help yourself and others who have suffered ACEs cope. So, the um, important thing, apart from understanding the problem, is of course understanding what the solutions are. So I want to spend the last part of this talking about how that person got help, how that can be done better, what people have done in different places. One of the important things is resilience. We won't stop all ACEs overnight, but the thing that often makes a difference between whether someone develops long-term problems or not is how much resilience they have, how much uh, inherent resistance they have to uh, the, the problems that ACEs cause some people. It's often called transforming potentially toxic stress into tolerable stress. And in most reviews, the most important thing is always having an available adult that you trust, just someone. Um, a safe space in which that threat to the systems that I talked about before goes away and it allows your body to reset at that lower level rather than the higher one. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, that must make a huge difference to people, that there is the hope that there's somewhere they can go or someone they can go to uh, where they feel safe and secure. Um, let's just see how much difference that makes. So, of course, this is low mental well-being, and as you might expect, people who live in poorer areas, poorer situations, have slightly lower, well, considerably lower mental well-being. But these are people with four aces. If we just look now at those who had also four aces, 
but has an always available adult in the childhood. That's the only difference. The levels of low mental well-being are nearly halved just because they had someone that they could turn to. This is weekly drinking, heavy weekly drinking. It isn't related in the UK, at least, to deprivation. It doesn't go up or down depending on poverty. But what it does go up and down on is the, what happened to you, whether you had an always available adult in a child, as a child, someone you could go to. And again, cut by about a third on those levels. It doesn't get rid of the problem. It's still higher than those people with no ACEs, but it's a considerable difference um, from what happens otherwise. The always available adults, we don't know who that always can be. It, I mean, it probably is a different person for everybody. It could be a professional. It could be someone from an extended family. It could be a combination of people o over a person's lifestyle. Life. We know that in many cases it is different people. Resilience doesn't just always come from an always available adult. And this is um, based on a, a review of different types of resilience. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these. There's too many. But what I thought I'd do is, is just point out the other areas an important thing is cultural connection. Whether people feel that they're part um, of their community, whether they can draw from people to support them in that community, perhaps when things are going wrong around them. Um, another critical element is about guiding your destiny and overcoming hardship, and that really is about whether you see opportunities or whether it feels impossible to get out of the situations you're in. That can often be something that schools play a big part in, um, as well as professionals. Uh, so that's another element that increases resilience. Um, and the final one is people's ability to manage their own behaviours and emotions, which um, uh, is often, again, coming from what people support people give them. Or, and that can come from a variety of areas, and I've seen it done in schools as well as in communities and other places. Um, there are a couple of other things that matter, but I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, uh, maybe it'll come to a shock as people or not, but sport makes a big difference, it seems to, whether people are engaged in physical exercise uh, can make a huge difference. And of course, and I'll come back to it, uh, people's economic situations also influence the, uh, how, the outcomes. Um, let's look at all that resilience together. This is a study we did recently, and I've just brought it all together to say whether these people are in low, moderate or high levels of resilience. Um, and this is whether people have felt suicidal or self-harmed. Um, and you can see, actually, even with no ACEs, it makes a difference how high your resilience is. But when you're getting up to people with four ACEs, it makes an enormous difference what levels of, 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 of resilience you have, from nearly 40% of people feeling suicidal and self-harmed down to around 16 or 17%. Um, it's not just in the UK. Uh, this is, again, going back to the Eastern European work, now, I think, across 14 countries. Um, we're looking here at lower and higher childhood resilience. Um, and um, if you look here at suicide attempts, exactly the same things. People with low childhood resilience um, are up at 25% or nearly 25%, dropping to nearly 11 or 12% in those who have high resilience assets during their childhood. Um, it doesn't just affect health or mental health, of course, it affects a variety of other things. Um, I said before about young children uh, taking time off school because of somatic and, and other issues. This is returning to the same thing now, and again, looking at it through a resilience lens as well as ACEs. And we can see here, this is with low resilience, um, people who took 20 more days off during, as kids during childhood, about 30% with four or more ACEs. But enormous differences, again, down to 13 or 14% when people have got high resilience assets during childhood in terms of just keeping them engaged in school. And some of those actually will be delivered through the school. So I'm going to come back in a minute and talk about schools and what they can do. So there's a variety of things people can do. The first one is thinking about how we prevent ACEs. Um, these aren't prescriptive programs. I think people should look at what's happening in these programs and think about what their own services can deliver. This is one called SEEK, which is Safe, safe Environment for Every Child Kid. I'm not sure whether it's in Norway. It's certainly uh, been piloted in Finland. Um, it does relate, reduce things like neglect and abuse in hard per, per, harsh parenting. Uh, it's basically working largely through paediatricians, but also through nurse. There's nurse-based programs as well, looking for the cues in, in, in parents who are, having, uh, uh, who are just about to have children or have very young children. 
looking for things like parental depression, substance misuse, other stresses, intimate partner violence, food insecurity, so poverty, and then later on discipline challenges and problems they're having with discipline in the family. It's not a complicated program. Like many of these things, the, the materials are largely actually available online for this one. And sometimes it's just about saying to people the obvious. It's about you need to feel good about yourself to be a good parent. And there are very simple interventions all the way up to more complicated ones. But the most important thing is it's about, first of all, identifying those individuals where there is a risk and making sure that some support is being given to them. Um, there are a variety of other programmes that come in later on in life. Um, nurse home visiting programmes like Nurse Family Partnership, Triple P, Incredible Years. There's a variety of ones in the early life stages. Um, parenting programmes were uh, normally slightly later on about helping people learn and supporting people who are having problems parenting and preschool enrichment. Those sorts of programmes have a good evidence base or a moderately good evidence base for reducing child maltreatment and injury. And of course, for the reasons we've talked about already, uh, the longer term programmes that have studied, made those studies over a longer term show that, that those programmes in early life actually increase high school completion, which is what we'd expect. And they reduce violent offenders, violent offending in, uh, in, a, in late teens, and they also increase employment in the mid-20s. And they may not be obvious to the people who are delivering those programmes, but when people follow these people up longer term, it's having beneficial consequences across the life course. So what I would say is it's not just programmes like I did, but it's about ensuring services are informed and integrated. Um, a, an example we've been doing in Wales, on which is called First Thousand Days, I'm sure it's not the case here, but people, we, we realised it was almost impossible for us to figure out uh, how the early systems of different support work together. Um, they were so complicated to, to, to work our way through uh, that we wondered how anybody found their way successfully through some of them. School, a little bit later on in life. This is based on Walla Walla, uh, a, a school that embraced ACEs in the US, in Washington State. They realized a third of their classes, they were in a poor area, had four or more ACEs, so a third of all their kids had four or more ACEs. It was the best predictor of health attendance and behavior in the school, better than things like poverty. So that was really, they realized that this, this was something that was really driving the problems they were seeing. Educational success was more related to the number of ACEs kids had than to the incomes of the families. So they changed. What they did was they worked with public health and others to inform staff about the impact of ACEs. Might seem obvious, but it wasn't obvious to those staff. All staff in the school were informed about that. Um, they used the principles I just laid out, so really things about building resilience, inquiry, talking to the kids might seem obvious about why they're behaving in a particular way, building resilience and competency skills, attachment, making sure they had someone they were attached to either at the school or elsewhere, and then helping them with that emotional control, uh, which is the other, other thing I mentioned. They saw a 75% reduction in fights, they saw an 83% reduction in suspensions and increased graduation rates. We've done similar work in England at the moment, so I'll come back to that maybe later on. Another thing, though, is, of course, people get older. Um, they still have the, 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 um, the consequences of ACEs earlier on. And this is about whether we should speak to people about those ACEs. Um, this is from um, uh, Feliti, who was the person who coined the term ACEs, uh, so made that term up in the States in the first place. Um, and this is pre-examination, so in primary care in the USA, they just asked people um, to complete an ACE survey before they went in to their normal consultation about whatever health problem they'd turned up with. At examination, they were asked, how has ACEs affected you in later life? Simple question if they wanted to talk about it. The preliminary results, which have now been published, show that they, they saw a reduction of 35% in the need for attendances at general practice and an 11% reduction in attendances at emergency departments. Um, and although we don't understand all of this, uh, we've got similar results in the UK, actually. Um, part of it is that people aren't necessarily talk, coming and presenting with what they really, what's really bothering them. 
and it's an opportunity for some people to talk about things and I'm talking to sort of who they've never spoken about these things before uh, and actually might be an underlying issue in why they're presenting in the first place. If you want to do that, though, you need a trauma-informed workplace. You need people who are workforce development so they can have those conversations, screening, as I said, it might be through SEEK or other things, so that they can identify people who have the right problems. It needs a whole practice change. It's no good just doing it with one or two people. Everybody in there needs to understand why. And you will need interagency working, and I'm sure people are familiar with that, so that where things are more severe, there are the right reference pathways. Uh, this is some work we did on in the UK. Uh, very briefly, it simply shows that in a normal primary care general practice setting, people with more ACEs are much more likely to be the ones who come through the door with mental health problems. 67% of the patients we saw said this was the first time they'd ever told a professional about the ACEs they suffered as a child. Nearly 7 in 10 of them had never mentioned what had happened to them as a kid before. 84% thought it was important for health professionals to understand what happened in their childhood. Um, even though we had a, a difficult job convincing health professionals it was important, it was really easy convincing people it was important. In fact, it turns out they were already convinced. 86% felt their GP surgery was a suitable place to be asked about ACEs. In Wales, uh, we've set up something called an ACE hub. Um, so this is a way of pulling all the different government sectors together so that we can share information between those. Um, but there's many other ways of doing this in different models in different countries. Uh, the critical thing is that you need a multi-agency approach to this. You need to share that information. Uh, and for all the reasons I hope I've expressed so far, you need to coordinate the response so that you get the right sorts of support. We're taking people on a journey from awareness. I know ACEs are important. I know what I can do. I know how to do it. Communities are ACE-informed, so we're working together in how to do it. And then, of course, the evaluation element that encourages people and finishes that circle that you can identify that you're actually making a difference. Criminal justice is a big player in that, so I thought I'd just say something to you uh, because it may not be an obvious partner. One, in every five, every, one call every five minutes are directly related to mental health in London to the police. 20%, I'm sorry, I mean, in other words, a huge pressure about dealing with mental health issues, not, not crime. Um, the vast majority of call-outs to police in many countries, I know in Canada and the UK, are about vulnerability. Nine out of ten in South Wales police complex, contacts are for complex uh, safety and vulnerability issues, not to do with crime. So they're a critical partner because they're often the people who are seeing people first um, I'm going to just do this. It's a little bit indulgent. I hope you don't mind. But this is, again, a study we've done. So this is a public protection notice, but it, I think it's a good example. We're right at the moment. Um, so a public protection notice is something, if the police go in, they can issue that to protect the child in that family. You'll have a different system, I'm sure, here. But that's a notice that they put in the place that says some protection is needed here. Um, in a third of cases... In a single year, families get more than one. So clearly, something hasn't happened that should have. Um, only 3.2, so a tiny proportion of those, end in some sort of care plan, which is put in place to protect that child and work with that family. And the problem is that the bar is so high that so much has to have happened before professions think we need to put something in place, partly because of the pressures on services. If it's a sexual abuse case, it makes it above the line. But all those other ACEs I've talked about, people have just seen drug use in the house, there may have been someone incarcerated, there might be some domestic violence, they don't necessarily, in fact, often make it above the line. In fact, 72% of public protection notices are just closed. That's it, they're just closed. The problem with that is, if you design any system like that, all you're doing is saying, well, we're just going to wait until everything goes above that line. So you're pushing everything in that direction. And instead of that, we have to get people in a position where you're pushing people the other way. You're equipping people when they identify these things to deal with them as best they can, at least at that point, and not saying, no, let's, let's wait until it gets as bad as sexual abuse or whatever, and then we'll step in. And that's part of what we're doing, working with the police at the moment. We have a memorandum of understanding. 
ensuring that the earliest possible age individuals are supported to following a health benefiting and crime free life. So we're working together on that agenda and we're training with the police, training them in looking. This is the, the lens, looking, exploring what's happening in the family, identifying what their needs are, trying to deal with them then if they can, but if not, signposting them to the right services immediately. Um, just a small example of that. This is called Operation Encompass, but it, it's quite neat. I, I, I may, so I'll just share it with you. And it's, it's across a variety of places now, not just Wales, England and others. Um, it's a simple one. If someone comes into a house where there's domestic violence, a poli police identify that. Um, um, a police support officer goes to the school of where the child was the next day and says, um, it's been, there's been some problems in the house. The kid might be a bit upset today. The difference that makes is that when the child comes in the next day, instead of being seen as rowdy and aggressive and all sorts of problems, um, where they may be expelled, isolated or whatever, the people in the school understand what's happened and they put in place, we hope, and they certainly do in some places, uh, they put in place systems which allow the child to calm down, uh, support them properly until they can re-engage in the rest of the school and the education. So that working together creates a very different experience for the child. Another one is with housing and homelessness. So we're working with staff in housing because often people are in supported housing. They see a lot more of what's going on in housing than other agencies do. Um, so it's about seeing what the housing agencies can do again. So what can they do to de-escalate things rather than wait until things are pushed into a professional service, which may, may have huge waiting times and problems? Working through this, trying to break the intergenerational transmission of ACEs. Um, the same is actually true of homelessness. So levels of ACEs are going very high in people who are homeless. And sometimes getting people into housing isn't actually about finding them a house. It's about dealing with the ACEs and the levels of trust and other issues that they have, uh, rather than simply providing um, a roof and some walls. Again, the critical thing here is doing that requires a whole range of agencies working together. I said I'd speak about inequalities. Um, I'm only going to put one thing up. Is it is true that people in poorer communities are more likely to suffer more ACEs. Um, wherever we look, we find that, in fact, Three times more people have suffered four or more ACEs in our most deprived versus our more affluent communities. In many ways, that's not surprising. Um, they don't have the same levels of resilience, the le same levels of social support to pull on. However, um, what's important, um, it doesn't matter what area you live in, wealthy, middle or poor, if you suffer more ACEs, your outcomes are still poorer. A couple of final things then want to think about when we're dealing with people. One is people who have more ACEs okay, are more likely to be um, less trusting of services. I'm sure, again, people may be familiar with this, particularly some ACEs. This is four or more ACEs and no ACEs. How many people, individuals, um, are not supportive at all? Uh, the police, for instance, a, a huge difference. So... If people aren't trusting in general, they're not necessarily going to be trusting of the services either. Health isn't so bad, but if we're looking at mental health services, um, actually that's pretty bad as well in the work that we've done. It's not all about interfering with the individual, interf intervening with the individual. It's also about what we do in the communities around them. A recent report in the UK from the, from the government, parental alcohol misuse is in about 37% of serious injuries or, or childhood abuse and neglect cases. Um, what we do about things like alcohol is critical to all ACEs. Alcohol plays a big part, poorly managed, in child abuse, domestic violence, parental separation, sexual abuse, suicide and incarceration. Pretty well all the ACEs are worse if you don't manage alcohol properly in your societies. Um, this is a study we did a while back, um, and the, the main figure I want to put here is one in 20 adults knew of at least one child who was currently uh, um, at risk because of their parents' or relations' drinking. That's what they knew about, one in 20. Um, and that's, imagine how many others were probably at risk behind closed doors. Um, finally then, or nearly finally, it, it's not... Um, a crime or even a bad thing to measure levels of ACEs in children. People worry about asking those questions. Um, there are four modules already in something um, 
call the health behaviour. There's four countries already using a module in the health behaviour of school-aged children survey. Um, there are optional modules, but people ask those questions and they use that information and it doesn't cause them a problem as far as I understand. And it's consistent with the rights of the child to be heard that we actually understand and measure these things and don't pretend that in some reason way it's going to make it better if we don't just ask about those issues. So, um, we're left with some challenges. We don't know everything about how these things happen and we don't know at what age they're reversible and we don't know what exactly reverses everything. We know that neglect, for instance, has a, uh, some areas of the brain very early on in life in, in infancy has an impact on and that can have an impact on their ability in school and a variety of other things. We know in two to three years old, this area, the call, the area called the cortex uh, is exposed to maltreatment, and that can affect things like how people's judgment changes. Again, three to five-year-olds, we're starting to understand that another area of the brain called the amygdala and hippocampus, sexual abuse is a critical element then in how things develop, and that can change ways in people's emotions are expressed, increase fear and panic. And... You only have to change a few of these things in something as complicated as that for everything else to start not working quite, well, quite rightly or in a slightly different way. Of course, it's working well if you're in a situation where you have to protect yourself because this is a response. Things and people are doing things which they think will protect them against their environment. But something like that can happen. A different part of the brain overdevelops. Um, but we also understand that things later on in life make an important difference. So there's no point at which it's too late to intervene. Sexual abuse, 8 to 10, affects social cues. Witnessing domestic violence can affect reasoning. And there's a variety of things which don't necessarily reduce those problems, but allow other parts of the brain to develop to compensate for those if we provide support later on. I'd just like to finish by letting people see this. It's all, not all a negative story. It sounds that way, but people who get particularly um, an, an adult, a coach, a someone to follow who can channel what can come through as aggression or frustration in a particular area can do some fantastic things with that. And you'll find examples throughout history of people who, under the coach of a mentor or someone else or a trusted adult, have converted those problems into something fantastic. Performing arts is one area where this happens considerably. Challenging these things and focusing them in sports is another one. And another one is curring careers. There are more people who ha have aces in health and curring careers than in other careers. And that's because I think probably people are motivated because of sometimes what happened to them. And as well as that is a really important outcome for breaking the cycle for other people, it's also something worth bearing in mind when if you're working with ACEs and talking to people that the people you may be talking to who are professionals may themselves have been experiencing those things. So we started with this pyramid. I didn't include um, preconception and fetal effects, but absolutely what happens to women when they are pregnant also has an effect. It's one of the ACEs that th those effects come through in terms of the genetic, um, the epigenetics, they come through in terms of the problems uh, that those children will have in later life. Um, and the problem really is at the moment that we only notice these issues, if you like, we don't even notice them at all, but they come through as health problems often at the top here crime, non communicable diseases, and other issues. The challenge is can we get the whole system to think about how they invest earlier so they don't have to spend tens or hundreds of times more at the top? And in reality, the easiest way of saying that, and others have said it, is we can either build stronger children or we can mend broken adults. So my final summary slide, prevention is possible of ACEs. If there are a major cause of non-communicable disease, they expose the health and economic value of good parenting. It's a critical thing, sometimes and so often actually are undervalued. But this shows just how important good parenting is. We need to consider ACEs, albeit that they happen in childhood across the whole life course. Um, we can develop individual and community resilience for those people who slip through the prevention net. Um, they are impacted by the environment. They are related to inequalities, but that's not the whole story. There is a joint agenda in ACEs, which is critical to connect health, social, education, and crime. 
We've, we don't know all the answers and we need a unified research approach. Critically as well, there are intergenerational benefits of breaking that cycle. I mean, that's a fantastic thing. If we can break the cycle, we can put families back on the right footing again. Better informed parents make better life course choices. Of course, some of it and much of it is about professionals, but it, there's so many people who don't know the impact of what happens to people as child, children, and the more that do know, many of them will make better choices on the basis of that. And a trusted adult, a single trusted adult, can make a remarkable difference. Thank you.